This is election 2018, the second congressional district forum in the Democratic primary. I'm Fred Martino. The rules for our forum are simple today. Candidates have 60 seconds to answer each question. They are to give their position on the issue and make no mention of their opponent during the forum. We welcome the candidates now, Mad Hildebrandt and Social Torres Small. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you, Fred. I start out with a very general question, Mad, and <laughs> that is why do you think you should win the Democratic primary? I think I should win the Democratic primary because I'm the, the best candidate to reach across the aisles to Republicans. Um, I am a veteran, I'm a farming, ranching background, and uh, these are things that are very important to our district. And um, I think that my stance on, uh, on being a, a Second Amendment Democrat also can reach across the aisle, even while I'm also a, a progressive Democrat in very many ways. And I think that just the, the two combined um, takes me right outside the box. Um, so thank you so much, um, Mr. Martino, M Mr. Martino, for having me here today, and Indivisible for helping organize uh, this forum. I, I think I should win because I've grown up in this district, and um, my grandparents immigrated here from Mexico, and my father is a social worker, my mother is uh, a teacher, she's been a teacher for almost 30 years, and through them I learned the importance of community and working together with everyone to solve problems. And so that's what I did when I worked for United States Senator Tom Udall. Um, serving this portion of the state and setting up his first New Mexico office um, in southern New Mexico. And um, so I have experience working with people to find solutions, and that's something that's sorely needed in Washington today. We need to bring real solutions to Congress and stop exploiting political uh, problems to, to gain points. Instead, we need to focus on solutions. Speaking of solutions, if you are elected, what would be your number one legislative priority? So we need to focus on making sure that we're serving all of New Mexico. Unfortunately, um, growing up here, I've seen too many of my friends and family leave New Mexico because they didn't feel like they could achieve their dreams right here where they grew up. And um, so we need to make sure that people have access to the health care that they need, that people have the education, quality education, and also that they have access to jobs. So the first priority would be addressing our infrastructure. And part of that is uh, cement. We need safe roads in our communities. But we also need infrastructure of the 21st century. So that's investing in broadband and cell phone service to make sure that we can bring in jobs. Because if you have to go up to the tallest hill to make a cell phone call, you're not going to be able to attract the businesses that we need to build our futures right here in southern New Mexico. Mad, number one priority for you. So for me, the, the number one priority that I see that we need to take care of in this district and across New Mexico is jobs. And in order to get jobs, I am an educator, so my focus is, is on education first. Uh, we need to make sure that we are taking care of our children so that they are not leaving this state and having to leave the state after they are educated. We have some of the best colleges and universities in this country and our children end up having to leave. We have two, two angles that we can do this. One is by making sure that, that after our students graduate that they can stay here because there are jobs and that would be broadband service in, in order to uh, so that our software engineers for instance can stay here in the state. We also need to focus on vocational education because that is something that is sorely lacking right now and by focusing on vocational education we can bring in federal dollars that can also help to to build businesses right in our own hometowns. Mad Republicans have had uh, an almost absolute hold on this seat going back to 1980. Uh, if you are the general election candidate, what is your strategy to overcoming that challenge? I'm a veteran, and I think that veterans' issues are very important in this district. Um, we have one of the highest uh, percentages of veterans in, in, uh, across the country and per capita. And, uh, because of being a veteran and having those issues be very important to me, I think it, it, that reaches right across the aisle, absolutely right across the aisle. I am also, um, as I said earlier, I, I'm farm ranch raised, and um, that our, our 
infrastructure and our needs uh, for our farmers and our ranchers are very unique in the state because of, of water and because of uh, just dry land farming even. And so these are things that I can speak to very, very well. Social, taking this seat for the Democrats, how do you do it? So um, one of my favorite things about this district is how diverse it is. And it gives you, growing up in this district, I learned how to work with everyone who's willing to do the work. And that's what we've really seen um, when it comes to collaboration. Uh, when I was asked to set up the Southern New Mexico office for Senator Udall, I wasn't asked to reach out to Democrats or Republican, I, Republicans. I was asked to reach out to communities. And so that's how we forged solutions. That's why I worked at NMSU to make sure we were bringing vital resources to the New Mexico State University. That's why I worked um, to help farmers and conservationists uh, really preserve reaches along the Rio Grande um, and make sure that the International Boundary and Water Commission was holding to its promises that it made both constituents. So I, I, I have experience working across the aisle. I've done it to find solutions and that's what we need for this district. What is your favorite thing about uh, New Mexico and, and what are you going to do to preserve it if you're elected? So um, I talked about my first favorite thing already. It's diversity and the, the fact that we all are experienced in working together to solve problems. So I'll take my second favorite thing and that's our public lands. Um, we have a deep love for our natural resources here in New Mexico and we have experience working to share them um, from water to our mountains um, to the, the entire breadth of our, our solar power energy. We have incredible opportunity here to use our natural resources and share them and, and use them to enrich our future life. And so that's, uh, that's what I love about New Mexico and that's what I want to work to preserve and protect. Matt, how about you? Your, your favorite thing about New Mexico and, and what you do to preserve it? I love the wild lands. That's, that's one of the reasons that I came back to New Mexico after my husband got out of the military. Um, if you travel around this country, New Mexico is, is really just has the most beautiful landscapes and the, most, uh, the wild, most wild landscapes. As I grew up, I would take my horse and I would ride out into the wilderness and I would stay out there for hours and hours as far away from anything as you could get. And so to me, the idea that, that our public lands are, are being attacked is, is an incredibly terrible thing. So I believe that we really need to focus on strengthening the Antiquities Act and, um, and just maintain our public lands to the best that we can. Okay. Meb, uh, what are you hearing from people on the campaign trail? Uh, is the single biggest problem facing our state? And if you're elected, how would you address it? So there are two that I, that I tend to hear the most, and one is, one is jobs, and the other one is the opioid crisis, and that's the one I'm gonna to speak to at this point. So when we talk about the opioid crisis, we're talking about people's neighbors, we're talking about their family, their, their brothers, their children, and when, we, when these people are, are caught, they end up going to prison, they're incarcerated, and when they come back out, the recidivism here in our state is, is just incredibly high. And so when you look at the states around us and you wonder, well, why is our recidivism so high for, our, for our, our, our children or our family members? It's because they aren't getting treated correctly. So what happens is we're giving them two, mo two months of treatment when they come on the outside. What, what the industry itself says is you need two years. And I need to make sure, we need to make sure that our, our children and our family members are getting that two years. Okay. Social, same question for you. When you're out there uh, meeting people, what are they telling you is, is the number one problem in the state and, and how would you address it? So the biggest issue I'm hearing is something that's not getting a lot of discussion in Washington, and that's making sure that affordable health care is accessible to everyone. So for example, I was in Hobbs and um, speaking with a couple that's getting ready to have their first child. And, and you know all of the um, trepidation that, that families have when they're getting ready. And um, the mother was just incredibly concerned because for every one of her prenatal visits, she has to travel across state lines for two hours to reach her OBGYN. 
And that's just not something that's, that's right. Um, and, and it leaves people feeling like they can't make it here in southern New Mexico and be healthy and have a good, healthy start when it comes to the future for their children. So we need to make sure that we're incentivizing healthcare providers to move into rural communities, that they're staying there after tuition reimbursements because there's a strong community home there. And um, also that we're structuring Medicare reimbursement so that it prioritizes primary care. Okay, well good timing for you now, uh, just by coincidence. My next question is about health care. You're aware, uh, I'm sure, that many polls show that a clear majority of Americans support universal health care that uh, is funded by the government. And uh, as you're probably also aware, both Senators Tom Udall and Martin Heinrich have supported Medicare for All, doing just that, a single payer system in the United States. Uh, do you support true universal health care, yes or no? And if you do, uh, how would you say that the, this country should achieve this and pay for it? So we need to make sure that affordable health care is accessible to everyone. And what's, what's ridiculous is that Congress's first vote was to remove the health care coverage that already exists. So Steve Pierce voted to get rid of health care coverage for almost 50,000 people here in the 2nd Congressional District. And, and if that vote, if that, that vote had um, become law, we would be facing a situation where we weren't 49th in childhood well-being, we're 50th in childhood well-being because that was the one thing that, that we've improved upon, is making sure that children have access to health care. So we need to make sure that we're defending the health insurance that we currently have. I think we have to uh, prioritize that. And we need to make sure that any coverage matters, that people have access to that health care right where they live. And too often in the uni in universal health care conversation, we're not focusing on that issue. But we also, it's a smart, it's a necessary goal that we must have to have universal health care coverage. Mad, your thoughts? Universal uh, health care, yes or no? And, and if the answer is yes, how, how do we do this and how do we pay for it? You know, I do, uh, I do believe in universal health care. And the, the number one way that we can um, expect to be able to pay this is to remove the, the cap on, social, or on the various taxes, the Social Security tax, so that the, the, our elder people are having the access to their health care through that system. Um, and also, when we're talking about um, health care, my family uh, spent 30 years, my husband spent 30 years in the military, and we have TRICARE. And the TRICARE plan is an amazing health care plan. It is, you know, single-payer health care. And it is an amazing plan that can easily be extended ac across, uh, across the, the, the country to, to multiple people besides just people that are in the military. And negotiated um, pharmaceuticals is, in, is included in that. And that is what I'd like to see, is the equivalent of what I have across the board to everybody. All right, we'll move to uh, another issue you mentioned, Social Security. Without changes, as you know, there is a massive shortfall in order to maintain current benefits. But critics of the current system say that this is completely unnecessary if the earnings cap on the Social Security right. tax is removed. Do you support that removal on that cap, yes or no, and why? And if the answer is no, how would you fix Social Security? No, we, we absolutely have to remove that cap. There is no reason that the wealthiest people in this country can, can be going through their, the day, their daily life and not paying their fair share. Everybody else is paying their fair share up to a certain point, and then, and then that's the end. You can make billion dollars, and it doesn't matter. And the, the idea that we have that kind of inequity in our nation that we're looking at what goes back to the end of the 1800s. And we cannot repeat, which we are already repeating. We're in a second gilded age, and we can't be repeating that again. And so I, we have to make the rich pull their fair share. OK, very specific question. So I want to repeat it because it's, it's, it's really specific. 
do you support the removal uh, on the earnings cap on Social Security, yes or no, and why? And if the answer is no, how would you fix Social Security? So um, Social Security is an essential, essential component of our retirement plans. We need to make sure that people are able to retire with dignity. I pay into Social Security, my parents pay into Social Security, and it's been an incredible, reliable system that we've all counted on. And we need to make sure that we can still count upon that. And so the way we do that is by lifting that cap, making sure that everyone is paying their fair share. And you know, it's, it's been too long that uh, people have got, the rich have gotten away without fully paying their fair share. And so we can solve that by lifting the cap and making sure that this essential program uh, continues to serve us for, for the years to come. Okay. I want to move on to another issue now that has really galvanized the nation's attention over the last few months, and that is gun violence. If you could name two specific actions that we can take to reduce gun violence in America? So I, I grew up with a family with guns. Um, I grew up with guns in the home and I'm a hunter myself. Uh, in fact, one of the first conversations I remember having with my grandfather, a serious conversation, was about gun safety. And we went through a checklist of the things that you have to do if you're going to use a gun to make sure that you're safe and that the people around you are safe. And that's why I don't understand why Washington thinks it can have loopholes about how to make sure that we have uh, a safe communities and safe children in our schools. And so that's why I, like most gun owners, support universal background checks. That's why I, like most gun owners, support a judicial process to make sure that we're keeping dangerous weapons out of the hands of dangerous people. Okay, Mad, same question for you. Two specific actions we can take to reduce gun violence in the country. Right. So I am a veteran and I do have guns. Um, I, as a, as a young person, as a, as a child, I was a, an avid hunter along with my, my father and my family. And we did take, uh, back in those days, you, it was National Rifle <laughs> Association and you took hunter safety. And that organization has gone away from that. That is, they're not focused on hunter safety in the same fashion that they were and that's, those are, we're not able to talk a, across the aisles anymore like we should be able to with other people that have guns. We are going to have to talk about, um, about banning assault style weapons. Uh, that is something we are going to have to do because the, it, they have gotten into the hands of people that shouldn't have them. And second to that is uh, mental health screenings so that everybody it, it has to go through a screening in order to pass the background checks and be allowed to purchase those guns. Okay. Switching gears, uh, Mad, name the social justice issue about which you feel most passionately and explain how you intend to address it if you are elected. So for me, the, the, the moment that, that propelled me into this entire race was when I observed a small child um, that was worried that her grandmother was not going to be allowed to stay in the United States of America because she was from Mexico. That moment galvanized me, and this, this is the, the entire reason, the, the entire background for why I'm doing this. So for me, when I'm thinking about immigration and families that are being taken, pulled apart and taken apart, and so I began thinking about DACA and our dreamers, and I realized that, that there is a program that we could do right away, and that is what I want to do, and that has to do with schools. All these children, our dreamers, go to school, they're taking history classes, they're taking English classes they're, and learning our language here, and they're, they're taking government classes. And when they're done, they take tests, and those tests should count towards their citizenship so that when they graduate from high school or college, they don't just get a diploma, they also get their citizenship. Okay. So um, the social justice issue that, that means the most to me um, is, is education. Because growing up with my mother, a teacher, um, we, we didn't have a lot of money. And I remember going to garage sales to look for uh, teacher supplies that my mom could take to school uh, because she wanted to give her students the best opportunity to succeed. It didn't matter where they came from or what their background was, this was their shot to make the most of their lives and to reach their dreams. And, and really, op 
education is, levels the playing field. It gives all of us the opportunity to succeed. And that's why we need to make sure that we're investing heavily in it. That's why the federal government funds programs like Head Start, and politicians need to stop using that as a bargaining chip and instead f always fully fund it without debate. And make sure we also have to make sure that, that, that Head Start is um, being fully utilized in New Mexico. Uh, we also have to make sure that people are getting job skills training, vocational school, as well as opportunities to reach higher education and graduate without school debt. Okay, well continuing uh, by coincidence on this issue, how would you change federal policies affecting K-12 education, if at all? So Head Start, um, luckily it's fully funded now, but that was being used as a bargaining chip for other funding um, in some of our, our spending bills. So we need to make sure that it's continuously fully funded and expanded because we can address education, the education gap before it starts in pre-K in pre education. Um, also, we have to make sure that national standards are used to, su to support students, not to punish teachers. And lastly, we need to make sure that we're focusing on career paths beyond K through 12. Uh, when I worked for Senator Tom Udall, we uh, made sure that we were funding a, an NMSU program that um, supported STEM students right here in our local communities uh, because we were addressing our workforce shortage and also making sure that there was a diverse representation of students um, getting, these, getting training in these essential fields. So we need to make sure that we're investing in our careers for tomorrow and supporting all kids to reach their dreams through education. Okay. Matt? So when I was, when my children were in school, I was an elected member of the steering committee in some of the schools that, that where we lived, which um, again, because we were military, was all, all over the place. And so I, I got a firsthand knowledge of understanding what went on behind the scenes um, for, for trying to make a school succeed with the testing. And our school, the, the schools that I was working for, no matter how good the schools were, always seemed to not be passing. They were failing schools, no matter how good the teachers were. And so I think that we need to disconnect this idea that, that, the, that a test can tell us that a school is failing or passing. We have to make that disconnect. Second to that, we need to begin in, in, with universal pre-K so that all of our children are prepared when they do get into K through 12. Okay. How would you change federal policy affecting higher education, if at all? Okay. I, that is where my experience, by and large, is I'm a, a history professor, uh, adjunct professor. And what I see time and again and with my own children my, and myself are people that have so many loans and so much money so it's such a burden of debt that crushes our, our young people that then is crushing our economy because these kids these young people can't get out from under that we have to make our schools our, our college experience as free as possible. If we can have free college, that would be the best thing. In Austria and Germany and multiple countries around the country, in the, around the world, they are doing this. This is not a new idea. So we can do this as well. And certainly, our, our federal government should not be making money off of people's student loans, and nor should a private company. So uh, I'm going to start actually where I left off because to make our higher education successful, we need to make sure we're connecting it through K through 12 so that students are prepared to choose um, to go to community college or a full um, four-year degree <coughs> to pursue the pathway of their choice and because there's honor in all sorts of careers and we need to make sure that we reclaim that. Um, we also do need to tackle student debt. Um, when, when I went away for college, I chose to graduate in three years because I knew that I needed to save money, and I still had debt. And coming home was hard because I had to look for a job that would allow me to make enough money to pay back those debts. So we need to make sure that education is affordable and that when students go to higher education, they have a clear idea of the future career that they want. Um, lastly, we need to connect on the other end as well. So I think Arrowhead is a great example of this here at NMSU, where we're connecting um, university students with entrepreneurs to build our local economy. Okay. Well, speaking of uh, building the economy and also speaking of controversy, 
an issue that has been in the news recently and continues uh, to be a focus not only at the national level but at the state level in New Mexico, the legalization of marijuana. Senator Martin Heinrich is the latest elected official to support the legalization of marijuana. Social, we we'll begin with you to uh, this issue. Do you agree? Should we legalize marijuana, yes or no, and why? So the vast majority of Americans agree that the federal government should not be criminalizing marijuana and, and emphasizing, emphasizing it or focusize, focusing on it as a priority. And um, Jeff Sessions has completely gone against that in his refocus on enforcing um, minor marijuana violations. Um, I clerked for a federal judge here in Las Cruces, and we saw incredible trafficking of serious, dangerous drugs. And when you compare that with the effects of marijuana, uh, it's, it's disgraceful when we put too much time into that. I think states have a key role in determining um, how to approach marijuana use. Uh, we need to make sure that if marijuana is legalized, that we're um, addressing how it, would be, um, uh, how it would be dealt with in terms of DWIs and as well as secondhand smoke. So these are things that we have to look into, and that's why we have to stay partnered with the states in addressing this problem. Mad, your thoughts on this uh, legalization of marijuana? Uh, do you agree this should occur, yes or no, and why? Right. So, as a, again, as a veteran, I know a number of other veterans who do have who have to use medical marijuana because of the effects of PTSD and associated guilt, and so, some of these people, and just pain. And a lot of these people cannot even leave their house without, without marijuana. Now, marijuana is not legal by, at the federal level. This means that the veterans do not get marijuana covered by TRICARE or by, um, uh, through their retirements, through the VA system. So legalization is going to make this something that is possible so that these people can get, get their medication paid for. Also, we can see that it would be uh, a bonus in our state um, as far as the, the uh, e economy. And we're watching other states all around us that are, that are legalizing, and if New Mexico waits too long, they will lose the, the bubble that, the, that they would get with the economy. Um, so yes, I, I do believe that we should, in the end, go along with what the states and what the people want, which is going to be legalization. Okay. You are watching Election 2018, the second Congressional District Forum with the Democrats running in this race. If you are not registered to vote, there is still time. You have until May 8th. In New Mexico, however, you have to register with a party in order to vote in the primary. We are a closed primary state, unlike some states that have an open primary and allow everyone to vote in the primary. So if you wish to vote in the primary, you can register by May 8th. You do have to choose a party, though, to vote in that primary election. You will find a link, by the way, to online registration. If you already have a state ID in New Mexico, you can do online registration. That link is on our homepage, the bottom of the homepage, at krwg.org. By the way, May 8th is another important important date for another reason. Early voting begins on May 8th, and Election Day is June 5th. We continue with our questions now, and Mad, I'll begin with you on this one, and it's something that both of you have already talked about, federal lands, but I have a specific question on this because it, it really relates to what we've been seeing over the last couple of years, dramatic uh, changes uh, in federal uh, approach. The Trump administration has advocated for policies to increase oil and gas production on federal lands. What is your position on this and why? It's very clear that we do have an issue with climate change. We know this. We do know that we are going to have to be moving towards, um, towards renewable energy. Expanding onto, onto federal lands is not going to, in the long run, be, be a successful program because we, not only are we looking at facing climate change, but we're talking to um, 
motor vehicle companies, auto, automobile manufacturers, especially all of the German uh, companies, are saying that they are moving away from gasoline-powered automobiles. So for us to be focusing on that is not going to be uh, a successful thing moving into, into the future. We are going to have to be moving towards um, solar and renewables. But at the same time that we're doing that, with the limited, as we're changing over, and our, our state, if we begin to focus more on renewables, then the, the people who are in the east who still are, are um, focusing on, on fossil fuels, we can be exporting those products instead of, instead of using them here in New Mexico, and that will be helping our economy as well. Okay. So oil and gas on, on public lands, um, I, I really appreciate we have to start this conversation with the fact that 30 percent or over a third, almost a third of our budget in the state um, depends on oil and gas and that funds our education. And so that's where our starting point, that we are dependent upon oil and gas production right now as a state. And so in order to invest in our future and to stop climate change, which is already starting to occur, we need to diversify. We need to begin and continue investing in renewable energy. We need to make sure that we're working on a renewable portfolio standard so that um, we have clear goals for uh, investing in that energy. And we also need to escape the boom and bust economy. We need to provide realistic options for job development with throughout our communities, especially in the communities that are already um, producing oil and gas. Um, in terms of the federal, federal lands, right now we're competing um, with state lands in Texas over the same overlying Permian Basin. And so we uh, know that we have to make sure that um, we're, we're not being undersold in terms of our oil and gas production. Okay, another uh, federal land question here. Many people, including federal officials, have expressed grave concerns about funding for our national parks and monuments, saying that in some cases, very basic maintenance is being ignored. What is your position on this issue and why? So I grew up um, enjoying public lands. I remember with pride the first time I hiked the Needles here in the Oregon Mountains and um, working for Senator Udall to protect our Oregon Mountains and Desert Peaks. And part of the protection has to be su sufficient funding to protect um, our, our natural resources, to make sure that they're not being abused, and to make sure that essential access is provided for. Um, we only succeed in protecting our federal lands if people have the opportunity to get out and enjoy them. And that's why we have to do more with interpretive work to make sure people know about trails and that we're diversifying our access so everyone has an entry point onto our public lands. May I add funding for national parks and monuments? Sure. Um, one of the first jobs I had when I was a kid was as a, the, the gate chat girl at the entrance to the, to, the, um, to, to the parks, to the park that was close by where I lived. And so watching and seeing how on the ground, how, what, how much goes into maintaining. These are jobs that, that our public lands are supplying, but our federal government is, is, not, is not funding. So these are jobs that when we start hearing from the other side, this talk about we can't fund it and let's raise, late, raise the, the, the price to get into the park, what we're talking about is people's jobs being put on the line and, and the, the idea that then they're, gonna be, they're, go, they're going to go away because all the maintenance workers are going to be gone. We, the funding for this is very simple. It's are you going to fund a war or are you going to fund national parks? Okay. And for me, it's national parks. All right. Well, speaking of uh, jobs, what is your position on gaining congressional support for economic development along the border. How would you do that? So it's, in, in, we can look at our entire state and our entire district as being along the border. It's not just along the border. We do need to work on um, importation and exportation along the border and work, work with Mexico. But we also have to talk about creating jobs and economic development across the board, across, across this entire state. And so when we're talking about that, again, we need to start looking at um, jobs training, at uh, unionization, at um, 
working between the federal government, bringing federal grants into our state, and through vocational education, helping young people begin to develop their own business plans and put those businesses into action all along this district from, you know, from border to border. Okay, Social, same question for you. Uh, gaining congressional support for economic development along the border, how would you do that? So uh, this is a clear example of how Washington currently does not get it. Growing up along the border, I know the importance of our relationship with our neighbor across the border and how our economic vitality is dependent upon that. We um, are a net exporter here in New Mexico, and so we need to make sure that we're continuing to support that. When I worked for Senator Tom Udall, uh, we worked to focus on Santa Teresa, port of entry to make sure that it was open at the right hours so that there could be the proper trade coming through um, to make sure that we were all benefiting from uh, this regional uh, opportunity. And so it's making sure that Congress gets this, that you have a strong advocate in Washington who understands the relationship and who has a proven history in working on it. All right, another question uh, on the border. You knew this one was coming, border security and the expansion of the border wall, your position. So this is another example of how Washington does not understand living on the border. Um, when I started working for Senator Udall, we um, had just, the United States had just made an enormous in investment in border security to build barriers along, um, the, along the border. And that, that used to be called a wall. It's, it's not anymore, um, but the reason why the pedestrian fencing in high traffic areas is see-through is because bo the Border Patrol requested it. They wanted to be able to see potential threats that were approaching from the border. And so we, we need to make sure that we're listening to the needs for security and, um, and supporting that. Um, and so that's what we do. We support technology, we support um, what has to happen along the border, and we don't use that as an excuse to work on immigration reform. Because what President Bush is doing is not talking realistically about border security, he's trying to divide the public with a political talking point. So I was in the Coast Guard, and so as a person on the, in the Coast Guard, what we do is we guard or take care of the borders, borders. So what happens right now, we have a, a federal government who is saying we have one border. Now if you want somebody not to come break into your house, are you gonna build one fence and just put that along the street? What happens all the rest of, all the, rest of the way around your house? You have, you have all of these borders, but we have this, this focus on a border and on a problem with, with another country that is not, it's fallacious, it's a fallacy. We are at the lowest level of, of cross-border immigration that is so quote unquote illegal that we've been in for years. And if somebody is actually going to be bringing drugs in here, they can dig under a fence, they can go over a fence, they can go around it by sea. And I just say that the border wall is is a fallacy. Okay. Mad, we move on uh, to another issue, uh, and that is immigration reform. Tell me about the principles that you support uh, for comprehensive immigration reform. Okay, so I am a, I am a strong believer in family-related immigration. Um, this provides a stability. It is something that we've done throughout our history as a nation. People come to America, and then their family comes, and then that family comes, and we, and we bring these people from wherever they come from in this world to this country, and they have a support system. And to, to do away with that is, is just an incredible idea. That why would you do away with something that's been successful for hundreds of years? Um, I already discussed about what I feel about DACA. I also believe that we need to have a more, a more permeable border so that the people that are coming across border to work in our farms and on our, on, in our uh, dairies or whatever, uh, whatever the job is that they do when they come here in America, that needs to be more open. The visas need to be much easier to, to get and to maintain and just open the borders in, in a much better way.
Okay, so Jill, your thoughts on this, principles that you support for comprehensive immigration reform. So I have a strong plan for comprehensive immigration reform, but the first thing I have to say and the first thing we need to do is pass a Clean Dream Act. These young adults have been used for far too long as bargaining chips. When 80% of the United States believes that these people should um, have citizenship rights, full citizenship rights. Uh, we just need to stop using this as a ploy to delay r addressing the rest of the situation. So that's first thing we have to do. Then when it comes to comprehensive immigration, one of the first uh, meetings I organized for Senator Tom Udall was a, was a meeting with a farmer who said we need to tackle immigration reform right now because I'm worried about our food security, because we need to invest in our future. And so we need to have a full addressing all of the potential ways that people want to live in this country. Work permits, family reunification, because we know that immigrants succeed when they have a network here, and skills-based immigration to make sure that we're investing in our future workforce, both through education and immigration. Okay. Social, uh the Navajo Nation has struggled with the legacy of uranium mining, and fracking is common in New Mexico. If elected, what actions would you take, if any, in regard to environmental justice? So um, this is my background. Um, having worked for Senator Tom Udall, um, I know the detriments that the Navajo Nation has faced along with others due to, to uranium mining, mining and um, the challenges that all of our communities bear because we bear the burden of our nation's energy needs. We are an energy producer and as a result we suffer from the social um, environmental justice challenges that come along with it. So we have to make sure that, that we're protecting our communities. And so as a natural resources attorney, as a water law attorney, I know we have to protect our vital resources and and work as partners together to make sure that we're safe as our communities. Okay. Mad, environmental justice. So when we're talking about uranium, as you were talking about, you know, we have the uranium plume and we have that that comes from um, in Cibola County. And I was I was speaking with uh, an, a man, a native man that was a Navajo that was sitting in his in the um, senior citizen, senior the senior group, the, and so they're talking about what happened with them, not just not just Navajos up in Rama, but also Laguna natives, and that they they were mining, they did the mining themselves, dressed in regular clothes, and then the people that were the managers would come, and they were dressed in full gear, so that they were you know in these suits and. And you could see the difference, he said. And now he's dying of cancer, but you know these other people knew that that would happen. We need to have ongoing studies, not just for our, the, the natives in that area, but also for the downwinders. And these studies are not being taken place in our country. Okay. We move on to a very uh, controversial and contentious issue, and it is something that uh, very often, though, gets overlooked in terms of forums. Some say that closed primaries and superdelegates create barriers to true representation by citizens. Valid means of increasing voter participation include automatic registration for 18-year-olds and same-day registration as well. Matt, I'll begin with you on this. What methods do you support, if any, for increasing access to the vote? So I, I believe that we need to be making sure that our children, our, our young people, are automatically registered to vote across the country. If you're going to get a driver's license, it should be an automatic um, registered vote. Um, I am also a firm believer in ranked choice voting, um, and I believe that that should be used at the presidential level, even. And ranked choice voting would allow um, the development of additional political parties and give people a choice, a true choice that they aren't getting now. And I would like to see uh, uh, just the development of a true democracy in a, in a fashion that we aren't having because of people that are, their voices are not being heard. Okay, Social, same question for you. Uh, if you can talk about methods that you support, if any, for increasing access to the vote. 
So um, as a former field organizer for Tom Udall, I know the importance of reaching out to people and getting people engaged in the voting process. Uh, it's a key, it's a, it's, it was one of the most exciting things to be able to come back to my community and start knocking on doors and get people excited about our democracy and our opportunities here. And, and it's hard when you knock on a door and there's someone who, uh, the person whose name is on your list isn't there, but the person who answers the door says, well, I'm not registered, or I can't register right now, or I can't vote in the primary because I'm an independent. 20% of the second congressional district are registered independents or declined to state, which means they're not part of our primary process. Uh, so we need to make sure we're looking at that. We also need to make sure we're continuing to do things like the great work that's happening in Doniana, in Doniana County with the convenience centers and expanding early um, voting opportunities. Okay. As you both know, over the last year, awareness has become much higher when it comes to sexual harassment and abuse. What can be done at the federal level to reduce this problem? So um, first, I just want to commend the people, women and men, who have come out to address this problem. Um, it takes immense courage, and we need to make sure that we're honoring that with action. That we have um, in, our, in our military, we're supporting brave men and women who come up and, and identify challenges. That we're also addressing it through education. Um, I think too often people don't know how to report uh, sexual misconduct. And uh, having training and having people starting young figuring out how to address these issues and how to bring them up I think is important. Um, we also need to make sure we're holding people accountable. As an attorney, I believe strongly in due process and I also believe strongly in the fact that no one's above the law. And so we need to make sure that, that we're holding everyone accountable in these situations. So I am a Me Too person myself. I was attacked while I was in boot camp. And I reported, because reporting does take place, what happens is that the women are not listened to. And that is what happened to me. It, it didn't matter. I am the one that, that took the blame and had to fight my way through it. Um, this is the, the experience that most women have when we're talking about the Me Too movement. We're not talking about women who, who cannot report, but they may be afraid to report. It's a, it's a whole different ball game. And what we have to do is change, change, change the, the playing field so that these women are able to talk about, and even men, that this does happen to men as well. And they need to be able to find a safe place to report that, and their the things that they say have to be listened to, and the, the perpetrators have to be held accountable. Okay. Despite increased awareness, there are still continuing reports about abuse by police, especially against people of color. What can be done at the federal level to address this? The first thing we need to do is retrain. I was military police, and I went through the police academy in order to become military police, and training this was one of the topics that we that we talked about and the training was so incredibly concise and one of the things that we're doing today that that there they we didn't do when I was military please we had we had uh, flashlights and you you took someone down with a flashlight you didn't hit, pull your gun you didn't so all of this this sudden increase that we have today you go from I'm standing here and then I'm gonna take you down that is something that you would not have done, that was not in our training. And so we're lacking the training, and we're lacking in just the discussion of, of, of why are you targeting a group of people? Is it fear? Is, if it's fear that these police officers are, are, are afraid of the people they're taking down, they need to be trained. So the federal judge that um, I clerked for presided over the Department of Justice suit against the Albuquerque Police Department. And um, we, there are clear um, efforts that the Department of Justice took to reach a settlement to make sure that the Albuquerque Police Department was doing the right things to um, get away from its history of brutality against citizens. 
And um, so some of those things were making sure that there was sufficient hiring, because when you don't have a big enough police force to make sure that they're integrating community policing, um, you can't uh, create the relationships that are necessary to have a safe environment. You have to make sure that you're investing in the right training and that people are held accountable when they depart from that training. And so it's, it's about looking, going into a police department, addressing the systemic problems, and making sure that we're repairing them holistically. Okay. I want to move on to another issue that is often overlooked as well when we talk about federal representation, but it's a very important one, particularly uh, in New Mexico with our research universities. Critics say that we are neglecting a basic requirement of the federal government, aggressive funding of federal research to advance our society. How do you see this issue? So we need to invest in our research institutions. We have um, four higher education um, colleges in, in this district, and there's essential research components as part of that. We also have an important relationship with our labs that do essential research, and we need to make sure we're connecting those two um, in terms of the opportunities that we have. When I worked for Senator Tom Udall, um, I advocated for and we received significant funding um, for specific projects here at NMSU um, because we have to recognize that the public is, is paying for the basic research that's then used later and translated into job opportunities and economic development. And that's something that NMSU is doing very well and we need to continue to invest in, is making sure that that research then gets applied um, elsewhere to, to further our economic development. Thank you so much. So when we're talking about um, research in, in, our, in our district, we, we rely very highly on those type of funds from our federal government. So we need to make sure that we keep on bringing these into our universities and into our labs and into our um, test sites. One of the things that we need to do is make sure that our students are getting grants and that that can be through um, federal grants and public grants and private grants and, and make sure that our students are getting these grants so that their, so that their research comes to fruition and then they can also um, begin to make sure that their research can be used and put into use here in New Mexico rather than having to send their products or the, send the students out of the state. Um, and I would like to see uh, much more uh, just the investment into, into our colleges. Okay. Uh, Mad, some Republicans say that parts of the Dodd-Frank financial reforms enacted after the Great Recession should be repealed. Where do you stand on this issue and why? I think that our, our banks have become these huge, like an octopus that is just too big. And when we're talking about repealing anything that takes away from the, um, from the controls that we have, this is, this, is not, uh, this is not something we should be doing. We need to be making sure that we keep controls over, over our uh, banks and controls over the ideas of, of monopoly. These are, these are two ideas that were very strong in the, in the early 20th century that we are completely forgetting and we're letting these things get so large that then we say they're too big to fail. And now we're talking about repealing things that are meant to help keep them under control. So um, when I graduated uh, and started looking for a job, uh, we, we suffered the, the Great Recession. And I had friends who had just bought their first homes who were struggling to make payments and couldn't sell their homes because, of, uh, because they were underwater. Uh, my parents were in that situation. So uh, when, when Washington starts talking about repealing measures that would keep that from happening again to our working families and um, hardworking individuals here in southern New Mexico, I, I take that personally because we have to learn from the lessons that we suffered. We have to make sure that we keep that from happening in the future. And so we have to protect our families here in the second congressional district. Okay. Another a question related to finances. Many Republicans, as you know, tout the tax law that they advanced as a major victory. How do you see the tax law? 
Well, um, the tax law may have been a, a major victory for the wealthy and for corporations, but it sure wasn't for working families here in New Mexico. Um, when we have a tax law that creates a massive debt that now Republicans are struggling to pay and threatening to pay by cutting our Social Security and our Medicare, we know that hits us and hardworking families twice. Uh, we're not getting those same tax benefits. Uh, corporations get their tax benefits forever, but the small ones that we saw here for lower earning um, individuals will sunset uh, after elections. And so we're smarter than that. We know that that's not serving us, and we know that they're going to use that to try to take our Social Security and Medicare. And so we have to, we have to push back. Okay. So what happened with this tax law is that the, the tax law was meant to take the money away from all of the working class and make sure that all this money goes up to the highest, the wealthiest. And we can see that in action as, it, as it's happening. The, the idea that was put forth was, is that it would be more trickle down. But we know after the Reagan years that that didn't work. So to try it again was, uh, you know, was not a very smart idea. And so now we're going to have to be dealing with, with the vestiges of that. And we are going to have to do as much as we can to protect our Social Security, which is right now under attack, and Medicare, which is under attack. Um, and just make sure that, that at least for, for the sh in the short term, that we are protecting those, those um, programs that are taking care of our, our elder, elder family members and our young family members, and just work towards the future. Thank you to both of you for joining us for this forum. We really appreciate it. We cannot have representative democracy without events like this, where folks become informed before voting. So we appreciate your willingness to come here today to talk with us and our audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you at home as well for supporting public media, which makes this kind of programming possible. It's only possible with your donations. And our representative democracy is only possible when you vote. You have until May 8th to register if you are not registered to vote in the primary. And a reminder that in New Mexico, because we have a closed primary, you do have to register with a party in order to vote in the primary. May 8th is an important date for another reason. That's when early voting begins and Election Day is June 5th. I'm Fred Martino. For all of us at KRWG, thank you for joining us. Have a good week.